Big Brother. Mainstream media. Government cover-ups. You want answers? Well, so does he. Live from Austin, Texas, broadcasting worldwide, it's Alex Jones. So, Mike, let's jump in and give us your top issue of the day. Well, hey, these, you know, commenting on what you just said there, these ties are always very deep on every issue. Look at the TSA. Look who's making money from the selling of the naked body scanners. You know, follow the money. Who benefits from the propaganda? Who benefits from the deception? It's always the, these people in power, sort of buddies of, of the White House, regardless of who's in the White House, whether it's Bush or Obama or Clinton or whoever. I mean, uh, look, look at the uh, the failure of the green solar companies. These are people who were buddies of Obama, who took hundreds of millions of dollars in government grant money, paid themselves huge fat salaries as CEOs, never produced a product, never produced a service, and then went bankrupt. It's just another form of government uh, theft. It's just like John Corzine. It's just like the bankster bailouts of Goldman Sachs. It's, it's just theft at every single level. And the one thing all these thefts have in common is they're all close buddies with the White House. Indeed, they are. And organizations like the Trilateral Commission and, of course, the Council on Foreign Relations headquartered in New York created in 1920, these are a couple of the elite crony buddy-buddy nudge nudge wink wink old boys clubs where all of this theft is planned and takes place and interestingly both of these organizations trilateral commission and cfr go back to the rockefeller monopoly and at, at, okay. at the same time that all of these thefts are taking place the regular people the people working for a living who are, who are breaking their backs to try to get ahead their money keeps getting stolen from them and they're prosecuted for crimes like uh, selling raw milk. So there, there's this, this two-tiered system where regular everyday people can't get ahead, they're criminalized for everything, where meanwhile the real criminals in Washington run free and steal everything. We've got to go to a break. We're going to cover this for awesome right after this. I'm reporting for Alex Jones today on The Alex Jones Show with Mike Adams, the health ranger. Okay, Mike, the Rawsome story. This is, we're talking before the break, a perfect illustration of how the little guy gets screwed. The hard-working person who's trying to do something good for himself, his family, and other people is getting completely demolished. So go for it. We've got a lot of inside information here. Let me let me brief you all on, on the latest. We thought we might have James Stewart. He's the operator of Raw Some Foods in California who was raided and arrested at gunpoint last year. We thought we might have him on today, but it turns out he's not available because the uh, Ventura County has him in a three-day preliminary hearing. It's just a preliminary hearing, but it's taking three days. He has, he's being persecuted, charged with 38 felony counts of financial crimes that we have investigated, and it turns out he factually has nothing to do whatsoever with these so-called financial crimes. And if you look at the, the financial crimes, what are they? Well. Ventura County claims that Sharon Palmer, the owner of Healthy Family Farms, or the original owner, I should say, there are other owners involved, uh, she was unable to repay investors on time because she was paying fines to the county and she was paying literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees because the county was raiding the farm and throwing her in jail. So the county came in, put her behind schedule on paying back the investors, and then they charged her with felony crimes of defrauding the investors because she was late repaying them, which the county wow. caused. Wow. So here's, a, here's a case of the state putting you in a position that then they call criminality and then charging you with 38 felony crimes. Now, compare this, John, with what has happened to John Corzine of MF Global, who stole billions of dollars from farmers all across America who had invested in that fund to try to reduce their risk as they grow crops. You know, farmers invest in, in uh, uh, crop futures to reduce their risk of crop failures and so on. And he, nothing has happened to him. No prosecution, no indictment. We don't no know where the cases. money is. We just don't know where the money is, right? Yeah, wow. we don't know where the money is. I apologize. I have a little bit of difficulty <laughs> yeah. hearing you come in when I'm when I'm talking. But um, 
it's, it's a case of selective prosecution and selective criminalization of individual farmers while the big, rich, fat cats get away with massive theft once again. Now, James Stewart of Rawson, I mean, this is just an incredible story to me. The guy is selling raw milk. His customers are happy. They love the milk. He keeps selling them the milk. All of a sudden, he gets raided. Now, from what you're saying, is it true that they're not now charging him with selling raw milk or contaminated milk, that all of these charges are, quote, about financial crimes? It is both, John. They're still charging him with, quote, selling unpasteurized milk, which he wasn't even doing. He actually didn't even run a retail store. It was a private buyer's club, a, a co-op. Everybody was a partial owner of a cow and of a farm, and they were merely picking up the milk they already owned. It's basic contract law under, under common law. But California has attacked that and said that that's, that's not valid under 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 their state laws. But now they've added on the financial crimes on top of that. And remember, Ventura County arrested him when he was in court a couple of weeks ago, and then they tortured him in the L.A. County prison, the L.A. County jail. It's called, uh, I believe the name of this jail, believe it or not, is called uh, Twin Towers. I yeah, that's, that's the name the, uh, of it, and it's probably that's been the name for it in downtown L.A. I've been it's there. Downtown L.A., and they subjected him to starvation, to hypothermia. They shackled him with chains three or four times around his waist. They subjected him to uh, 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 medical procedures without his permission, and he nearly died of hypothermia, shivering in isolation in a cell, and he, he was lost in the system for eight days. This is the way they treat farmers in America today. This is what's happening to James Stewart. We've documented it, and more on this is coming out, and we will be sharing that documentation with Kurt Nemo, Alex Jones, Paul Joseph Watson, and the whole team there at InfoWars. Yeah, I'm looking for stories to keep on showing up on this. And, you know, the other thing, of course, that James said was that in the final hours, at the L.A. County Jail, somebody in that cell block, that area, released horrendous sewage that yes. came flooding into the cells an inch or two deep on the floors in the cells that contained feces and other horrendous material. And his shirt was there. I mean, he was already freezing, and he was given a filthy mop and told, uh, you know, to clean it up himself. Yes. I mean... This is just unbelievable. Well, well, think about the irony, uh, the, the, the sick, almost pathetic, devilish irony of all this. The state is charging him with crimes for selling milk with living bacteria, which we call probiotics. It's good for you. But the state says it's unsanitary, therefore you're a criminal. And what do they do? They throw him in a jail where they flood his jail cell with raw sewage, which, of course, is... is heavily contaminated with dangerous and deadly pathogens and they say this is justice this is what the state says and they did make him clean out his own cell of raw sewage by hand they actually gave him a small squeegee and then after he had squeegeed out the raw sewage out of his jail cell they then left him in that cell for another 30 plus hours and i also confirmed this story with a former la cop uh, I don't want to release his name yet, but he confirmed with me that this is not only happening, that this is not only a true story, but that this is routine in the L.A. jail system, John. I agree. It's routine. James uh, mentioned the other day that he was at a conference where he was able to talk to a few sheriffs from different parts of the country. And he told them that he lived in L.A., told him this, what had happened to him, and basically one sheriff just said, move. Yeah. Move. I'm because, the same thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. This, is, this happens. This happens in L.A. This is not just James, but we have to keep in mind that, you know, James was a guy who was arrested for selling healthy milk. Really, I mean, that was why he was arrested. That was why he was raided. That was the genesis of the whole thing. And so this is what he's subjected to, and you're right, it's perfect. It's like saying, okay, so you claim to have uh, milk that's free of contamination with all these uh, organisms, so we're now going to flood you with the most contaminated organisms we can find. 
Yeah, and think That's about right. how much bail was set in this case, by the way, John. Ventura County slapped him with $1 million in bail, and they slapped Sharon Palmer with $2 million in bail. Now, now look at how this is selectively applied. Look at the case of the Penn State assistant coaches there who who are uh, were reportedly involved in child rape and pimping out children for uh, sex favors to you know wealthy clients in that area Com complete sicko type of perverted behavior he got off on uh, i think a hundred thousand dollars bail with with no uh, he didn't even have to back it up with any kind of assets so an right. unsecured bail, whereas James Stewart, the milkman, gets a million dollars in bail, which is more than you even see for murderers and rapists. So it's very clear that California is really selectively persecuting this individual for their own political reasons, which we could probably get into on a later show. Yeah, absolutely. So give us your take on these Obama initiatives that have been coming down the pipeline so rapidly of late and what they spell for America. Well, I'm going to help help our listeners here parse this information. Uh, the, the executive order is called the National Defense Resources Preparedness Order. It was issued on March 16th. Uh, Paul Joseph Watson and, and Alex Jones have covered it, especially on the show yesterday, but there's more to it. Uh, we posted a story on this on Natural News last night. It's It's gone very viral, 10,000 shares on that just this morning. But some people were asking, well, wait a minute. The federal government hasn't seized all the farms and all the food and all the fertilizers. No, they have seized control. They have asserted authority and control over all of these resources. The actual physical seizure will come at a later date. But this executive order does assert control. And I want to explain how that works by parsing the language of this executive order so that everybody understands it. If you look at section 201 under part two, priorities and allocations, this word allocations is crucial to understand because it says that this, this order is designed to quote, allocate materials, services and facilities as deemed necessary or appropriate to promote the national defense. And that could mean anything. But if you look at the word allocation, how do you allocate something if you don't have it? So in order for the government to allocate something, it must first confiscate it, John. And that brings me to my first slide right here. Allocation is confiscation. Can you see that? Uh, for those of you watching on prisonplanet.tv, allocation is confiscation. So wherever in this order that you read the word allocation, you must first assume confiscation takes place, and then once the government has those resources, food, tractors, livestock, energy, water, labor, metals, you name it, then they reallocate it based on their priorities. And we'll talk about their priorities as we continue this, John. Well, that's, that's an important point you're making, very important, Mike, as you're saying. How are you going to allocate something unless it's already under your control? Which essentially means you own it because you can do whatever you want with it. So this idea, you know, they like to use this word allocation. It sort of a, gives you the sense of, oh, we know what we're doing and we're planning and we're putting some over here and putting some over there. All in the best interest, of course, of you, the people. That's all we have in mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's really a centrally planned economy. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. It's it's it is really a communist style takeover of all private property across America. And when they get into to food, uh, specifically in this executive order, that they named food, farms, fertilizer, livestock, tractors, uh, all of this food production equipment. And then in another section, they define what does what is a food resource. And here it is, quote, right from the WhiteHouse.gov uh, document, food. Food resources means all commodities and products or complements to such commodities or products that are capable of being ingested by either human beings or animals. That's Hold everything. on, Mike. Hold that thought. we got to go to a break here. This is John Mappaport sitting in for Alex Jones. John Mappaport back sitting in for Alex Jones on the Alex Jones Show. We're rounding the far turn. We're coming into the last half hour plus here with Mike Adams, the health ranger. And Mike, you were talking about being able to understand the language in these executive orders and, you know, pronouncements from the White House and how this is shaping what really is happening in America. So please continue. Uh, this is fascinating. 
Yeah, we're going through the language and the definitions so that everybody really understands just what a big power grab this is, this executive order that was issued by President Obama just a few days ago. We covered the food resources definition before the break there. There's one more sentence that's important there because in this order it states, and again, this is posted on whitehouse.gov. This isn't some made up thing. This is right there out in, out in the open. As Alex said, it's hidden in plain view. The words say, quote, food resources also means potable water packaged in commercially marketable containers, all starches, sugars, vegetable and animal or marine fats and oils, seeds, cotton, hemp, and flax fiber. Uh, so this... Wow. Federal government... Okay, we lost Mike there for a second. He was about to say the incredible extent here, I think he mentioned even hemp, of control by the government over all of these resources when they say food they mean anything that you could possibly ingest or could be considered a food or supports food industry allocation becomes absolute control and that's what's happening here we're going to try to uh, bring Mike back but we're going to continue in the meantime oh Mike you back yeah, I, yeah I'm back uh, uh, is a little glitchy Good. today uh, continuing with energy, uh, this executive order also claims total control over all forms of energy in the country, including solid fuels, petroleum, gas, coal, solar, and wind. So everybody out there who has a solar system, you think you own it, no you don't. The federal government owns it. Obama just seized control or asserted control over your solar system, meaning the federal government could come take it at any time if they deem it's necessary for any kind of a national emergency or national defense. And again, that could, that could be from anything. It could be something they make up. They could post something on a message board somewhere and say a terrorist has threatened to, for example, blow up a train station. They could use that as the trigger to say, let's confiscate all power. There goes your solar system. It's not an exaggeration. You know, yeah, Alex and uh, Paul Watson pointed out a very good distinction, too, in this latest executive order of Obama's, which is there's no difference, really, between war, emergency, and peacetime. That this, you know, allocation, this control, the seizing of everything could take place in either case. We don't yes. have to be at war. It doesn't really matter. It's, as you say, it could be an incident provoked by the powers that be. It could be, you know, a whim. It could be anything. It's just like Obama saying, well, I'm not going to kill anybody, but I have a right to order anybody who's an American citizen be killed but of course I wouldn't do it and then you say well why did you pass the law in the first place you know right. well we had to or something it's the law once it's it's an order or it's the law there are people that are going to stand up and salute this and that's the important thing let's get to uh, stockpiling here's another slide stockpiling when the government's stockpiling that's good when people are stockpiling that's bad so there's a there's a, a another selective system of logic for stockpiling and in this executive order it says specifically section 202a it says that the secretary of defense oversees the military use of civil uh, civil transportation stockpiles managed by the department of defense and directly related activities and then it goes in to talk about materials acquired under this executive order if in the judgment of the secretary of defense isn't that the man who just said the un runs our nation as the national defense stockpile manager so do you understand this the resources across the country are being grabbed and then controlled by a man who says congress is essentially null and void and the u.n makes the decisions for us so how does that serve america's interests you tell me panetta recently of course said that there was no way that war was going to be declared aggressively by the united states without u.n approval which raised about 20 eyebrows in Washington and millions of eyebrows around the country. Absolutely incredible. And also here, what we're talking about is suggesting at this time, at this crucial time, during a presidential campaign, during an economic deep, deep, deep recession, that we're going to call this wartime, emergency time, control time from above. 
We're coming down to another break here. This is John Rappaport with Mike Adams, who has a lot more for us on the language of the Obama resolutions and pronouncements. Sitting in here for Alex Jones today on The Alex Jones Show. We'll be right back. Do you understand how dark it is? How far down the line we are? How late it is? Mike Adams, the health ranger. And Mike, uh, continue to explore the language that's hidden in these Obama declarations about natural resources. Sure, well, one of the most often used strategies of tyrants is to uh, pass laws and regulations that are sufficiently vague to allow them to interpret it in any way they want down the road. And then they can claim, well, that's the law. Just like Hitler said, well, it's, it's, that's the law. You know, we're going we're gonna to kill all, all these Jewish prisoners and we're going to invade these countries. And that's the law. Well, as Alex often mentions, just because it's the law doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it just. It doesn't make it moral or, or ethical. So we have all these violations of law going on and they're all being, quote, uh, uh, made official by words on a piece of paper that really don't mean anything. Now, one of the key concepts in this executive order is is this one, the continuity of government, but never the continuity of liberty. Now, think about this. If you look at the language of this act, this order, everything about it, and, and most of what the federal government talks about today is protecting the continuity of government, protecting government with stockpiles of weapons, ammo, communications, food, water, medical gear, in caves, you know, all across the country, well, at least in certain strategic areas, I should say. But there's never talk about the continuity of liberty. There's never talk about how do we protect the people. There's never talk about maybe the people should stockpile something. In fact, it's the opposite, John. They say that when people stockpile supplies, they might be terrorists. So wait this a minute. Was, this is oh, fantastic, Mike, that you, you brought this up. This distinction between different views of stockpile. You know, I mean, because I'm a reporter, I can suddenly whisk back through hundreds of stories that I've read in my life. So-and-so was arrested and accused of stockpiling, right? right. <laughs> stockpiling this or that. Oh, we got to watch out for this guy. He's stockpiling food. Can you believe it? In his cellar, he's got like six months' worth of food. Oh, my God. But on the other hand, the government is stockpiling weapons, is stockpiling reserves of oil, is stock whatever the government stockpiles, we automatically salute it. Right, and remember the alerts issued by the FBI a couple of weeks ago, which was, was covered on InfoWars quite extensively, that they said anybody who goes to a military surplus store and buys MREs which, and then stockpiles the, that food might be a terrorist. It's almost like a, jo a Jeff Foxworthy joke. If you do this, you might be a redneck. It's like yeah. if you have a tattoo, you, you might be a terrorist. If you buy food, you might be a terrorist. In other words, if you do what the government does, you might be a terrorist, but they're not. So, I mean, think about the government. They're stockpiling weapons, ammo, communications gear, medical supplies, resources, all kinds of things. I mean, underground bunkers, underground cities, in fact. But if you have more than three days worth of food in your pantry, you're suspect? Give me a break. This is part of the same crackdown, I believe, that happened to James Stewart and Rossum. They look around and they, they're looking really, if you boil it down, for independence. You know, you can call it whatever you want to. This guy's thinking for himself. He's got, you know, three weeks worth of food in his house. Uh-oh. Right. This guy's selling raw milk. He's out of control. He's out of our control. Uh-oh. He's thinking for himself. We got to stomp on this guy's head. This is almost like saying to me, you know, the free market is a joke. That's what they're saying. It's a complete joke. We're not going to stand for the free market. This guy has a club in, it, in L.A., and he's got people that are willing to pick up milk from a farm, and they're part of the club. We're not going to allow that to happen. This is too free market. We want top-down control. Every bottle of milk has to be pasteurized.
That's true. The, the government wants to create victimization. They want people to be helpless and dependent because that gives government the justification for existence. And I've got one more paragraph to mention from this executive order, but I want to also say, John, I hope you and I can get into some positive solutions. We always talk about the problems, and I know we've also got great ideas on solutions. So let's, let's think about what we can give listeners today on how they can stand up against this and take back their freedom and take back their liberty and take back their, their sovereignty as individual citizens of this great nation. But here's, here's the section I want to read. And also, uh, well, this is section 804C. This is the last paragraph of the executive order right before Obama's name signing the order. It says, listen to this, this order is not intended to and does not create any right or benefit uh, enforceable at law, blah, 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 to essentially to agents or employees or any other person. In other words, it's saying that even though we, the government, are confiscating everything across the country, it does not give you, the people, any right or any benefit to any of those resources that have been confiscated. So it's, once again, very clever lawyer language, sufficiently vague, but if you read between the lines, what it really means is we, the government, can come take from you your food, your seeds, your solar panels, your cattle, your tractors, and you don't have any right or any control over any of it. That's exactly what this executive order states, and it can be initiated or triggered by any statement. It could be a press conference at the White House. We're now in a state of emergency, and we can't tell you why, because that's a national security secret, but we are. Trust us, we're the government. You see how that works, John? <laughs> yeah, do I see how it works? I mean, I've known people that have had their computers confiscated by the cops or DAs and trying to get those suckers back a week, Forget a month, it. a year, sometimes they never, oh we don't know where it is, it's lost in the system. So can you imagine this idea when you say confiscation, they mean confiscation. In other words, uh, you guys are back there, I don't know, it seemed like four or five years ago, you took all my farm equipment. You remember that? When we had that uh, storm? <laughs> you know, oh yeah, uh, I seem to remember that. Well I'd like it back if you don't mind gee, we don't know where that is. We think it might be right. in um, Argentina now, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I actually have an interview on, on the record with a central Texas farmer who said on camera, on the record, that FEMA was calling the farms. This was following uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, FEMA was calling all the farms and inventorying all their crops, all their seeds and all their equipment, asking what they had. And he told me that the farmers complied and they gave them the list. And I said, well, wait a minute, don't you realize FEMA's building a database of all the food you have, even food in the ground that hasn't even been harvested yet? Why do you think they would want such a database? And the answer is, well, yeah, I guess because they want to take it. They want to redistribute it, John. See, they want to reallocate it. So they want to take yeah. what's yours and give it to their, their people and call it, you know, national defense. Speaking of solutions, the issue of freedom is to me the key. In other words, if anything is surviving this country from where it originally was framed in its founding documents, it is that idea of freedom. And yes. I know certainly in the medical area, and I believe it's also true politically, that when you bring up and you force the issue to be the issue of freedom, no matter what the government wants to twist it into, you have a chance, you have a fighting chance. For example, the government says that somebody is forced to take certain medications. You say, wait a minute, are you saying that I have no freedom to decide whether a medicine goes in my body? You have a chance of fighting that way. You have a chance. Yes. And uh, that's why freedom is so vital to be the central issue here. I think it's crucial, John, that the listeners today assert their constitutional rights, their God-given rights, their natural law rights, to, to have ownership of private property, to have ownership and control over their own bodies, to have the fundamental God-given right to choose what kind of food you want to consume, what kind of medicine you wish to consume, and even as parents, to have the right to control 
the decisions of, of what your children drink, what your children uh, get in terms of medicine, what they eat at, at school in terms of a brown bag lunch. And if you think about it, all of these things are under attack, every one of them. We saw the home gardener under attack in Michigan, that was Julie Bass. We've seen the, the, the brown bag lunches made by the parents under attack at schools now where they have food police that make the kids eat uh, chicken nuggets manufactured out of pink slime instead of the, the food brought from home made by their parents. We've seen farmers under assault, the Amish farmers, Vernon Hirschberger hauled into court for his raw milk. Every one of these is under attack, including the right to own private property, as we've seen in this executive order. So I'm curious about your thoughts on this, John, but I would say the answer is, it always is, restore the Constitution. Restore the Bill of Rights. It's always the right answer. Ron Paul, Ron Paul, Ron Paul. It's always the right answer. <laughs> yeah, restoring the Constitution to me is always the right answer. And part of that solution, by the way, and there are groups around you can find and explore, restore power to smaller units of government, like the states as opposed to the federal government, the counties as opposed to the states, the cities as opposed to the counties, and so on down the line. You can see in the 10th and 11th Amendments of the Constitution where that is explicitly stated in the Reserve Clause and other clause that has to do with freedom uh, being really given back to the states. Now, people will argue about this and say, well, the states are corrupt and they're horrible and they always have been, and therefore we should have the federal government on top of the whole pile. This is absolutely not the case at this point in time. The states at least yeah, have a chance. And I can tell you just briefly, there are a number of states that could put into effect free market practices if they were free from federal control, that would make their states economic bonanzas. I won't get into details here, but it would work in a second. Mike, oh, yeah. you were going to say? Hey, if a state just legalized hemp farming, I'm talking industrial hemp, there not even go. smokable med medicinal pot. I'm talking about industrial hemp that you can't even get high on. If a, if a state like... Uh, uh, even Texas, let's say, if they legalize growing hemp, do you realize the, the economic abundance of the agricultural sector in Texas? Texas would be a massive exporter of hemp all across the country. Hemp seeds, hemp oils, hemp fibers, hemp textiles. It would be like money raining out of the sky on Texas farmers. So why doesn't Texas legalize hemp or, or another state? Hemp grows in much of, of the country. It's a very abundant crop. It's just one example. There are thousands of these examples where we could restore economic prosperity and restore liberty at the same time. Absolutely, Mike. And for example, in the area of alternative medicine, there are places where it's much harder to practice than others around the country. Well, if a state like California, for example, decided, look, we're really going to open the door, not just partway, but all the way to alternative practitioners under the mandate of do no harm, which can be easily framed into a law. It's been done other in other states. That's right. And now, all of a sudden, California becomes the premier place for people who want to, by their own responsibility, to show up and get alternative medical treatments, alternative health treatments. Are you kidding? The economy of California would boom out the top in six months. Absolutely. And then the idea of these states giving back their rights to the federal government would never happen. Texas, uh, they're, 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 we can't grow hemp anymore. Are you kidding? Never See, this, is, this is the thing. These solutions are right at our fingertips. They're readily available. All these people in Washington parade around like they're trying to figure out how to solve the economy. You know, people at the Federal Reserve and the banks. How do we solve the economy? Uh, uh, legalize freedom that's how you solve the economic problem legalize it you know jonathan emore wrote a book restore the republic that's a good read it's the intro was written by ron paul it's a very important piece you know legalize freedom and abundance naturally follows but that's exactly why that they're crushing liberty because they don't want people to be free and to be abundant and to be innovative on their own they're trying to crush the economy and crush freedom at the same time and Folks, if, if we don't wake up and turn this, turn this thing around, I mean, we, we could very easily be crossing a tipping point very soon where it's too late. So wake the heck up. Restore liberty now or you may lose it for generations. And going along with that, Mike, is decentralize. That's the 
way to restore liberty in many areas, in many fronts. Decentralize the power. Who's got the power now? Well, the federal government does. The federal government, if they don't have the overt power, they have the power of the purse strings because they can come into a school system or any industry and they can say, hey, we're dangling some money for you here, but if you That's want right. the money, you've got to do this. No thanks. We don't want it. No thank you. We don't need it. We're going to take back our own power at the state level, the county level, the city, the town, the village, the individual level. You know, there's an this interesting... This is a trend. The metaphor for this, which I'm sure you'll appreciate, John, is that in a human body, when power is decentralized and every cell plays its proper role, you have a healthy, functioning, holistic system. When you have a group of cells that tries to take over power and take over control, you know what that's called? A cancer tumor. What is big government today? An economic cancer tumor. It's the same. The metaphor applies. We have a cancer in our nation. It is called centralized command economy control. And these executive orders that we just talked about further that cancer. We must reverse this cancer and save the patient, which is our republic. We can only do that through holistic decentralization of power, support of the, the immune system of the nation, which is the people, the people speaking out and saying we demand our rights as guaranteed under the Bill of Rights to restore the republic, restore our liberty, restore our economic abundance. I mean, it's all right there in front of us, John. It's not a myth. History. It's a blueprint for liberty. It's right there in front of us if we just grab it. You know what I mean? You bet, Mike. You bet I do. Absolutely right. When Alex and I were talking the other day uh, in an interview that we did at InfoWars here, we got to the point where it was, you know, these guys, these guys who think of themselves and see themselves as masters and controllers, these elites, they're really committing suicide. This is really what they're doing. I mean, underneath it all, that's where they're going. The only problem is, is that they're tending to drag everybody else along with them. And it's just the analogy that you gave of cancer. That's how they're committing suicide. They're going out there to the point where they're restricting other people's freedom so much that they're destroying themselves in the process because that's what happens when you try to restrict other people's freedoms beyond a certain point. That's what's going on. And, and they, they are, are truly suicidal. Insane. They, you're right, they're suicidal. They're insane. Alex talks about it all the time. The global elite have pushed too far. They're so insane. I mean, they're so, so they're sociopathic, insane demons almost from another dimension or something. I say that jokingly, but I mean, they are insane. They're so insane that they're going to destroy us at the same time they destroy themselves and they don't care. Their quest for power will lead to their own destruction. And they can't see that happening because they're, they're just completely infected with insanity. That's why those of us who are sane, who are rational, who can put the pieces of the puzzle together, who can connect the dots, who can see what's about to happen, we must rise up peacefully and, and with knowledge and with wisdom and say enough is enough. Let's turn this thing around. Let's get to some solutions. Let's legalize freedom in this country. Go ahead, John. Okay. We're going to take a break here and then come back for the last segment. This is uh, John Mappaport sitting in for Alex Jones with Mike Adams the health ranger we're talking about your freedom our freedom everybody's freedom and what's at stake here in this global insanity you can visit me at no more fake news dot com natural news dot com for mike adams the health ranger mike in this last segment here i think it'll be interesting to mention a little bit about celebrities you know back in the health freedom days of the early nineties there were a lot of celebrities like James Earl Jones, Mel Gibson, Mariel Hemingway, Lindsay Wagner, who came out in favor of the freedom of the people to have their choice in whatever food they really wanted to eat or milk to drink or supplements to take. And now, all of a sudden, we don't see celebrities showing up in public speaking on behalf of freedom, as you're talking about. A whole change has occurred in a matter of a little over, uh, you know, 15, 20 years here. It's very strange to me. There's so much pressure now, political pressure in Hollywood, that these, these celebrities have learned that 
when they speak out, they get punished financially. They lose roles in movies. Their, their careers go down the tubes. And it's it's only celebrities who have a lifetime of success that aren't afraid to speak out who are who are actually doing so. For example, Suzanne Summers, to her credit, has put out a book challenging the cancer industry. She interviewed complementary and alternative cancer doctors all across the country. Uh, I don't recall the title of that book at the moment, but you can search Suzanne Summers anywhere and find the book. And that was a really amazing, wonderful investigative work and of course she was attacked for doing that there are others who are attacked for speaking out and you're right john it, it's a shame that the political environment today favors those who stay silent because that's exactly the opposite of what we need we must speak out and, and for those listening today too it's you know this is freedom is not a spectator sport you've got to take action or we will lose this republic very very quickly Decentralizing freedom has a precedent, it has a program, it's a thing that can be done. To try to bring more power down locally, you see, from this top-heavy, gigantic colossus, all the way to the individual. And there are steps and there are organizations and there are things that you can explore here. This is not just, we're not just talking hot air here, folks. Mike put his finger on it. Legislate freedom. Doing that changes everything and then more people begin to show up all of a sudden they say oh yeah freedom I forgot that you know I've been reading the newspapers for the last 15 years and come to think of it I've never seen the word individual with the word freedom next to it isn't that amazing <laughs> you know where did that go yeah well we're bringing it back folks we're bringing it back well, you, you think about the role that the government is trying to take now. It's the role of saving you from yourself, which was brilliantly illustrated in, in the South Park episode of the, the TSA, the Toilet Safety Administration. Brilliant. <laughs> because this one woman fell in the toilet, now everybody has to have toilet seat belts. Well, we've got to stop thinking of the government as our savior. We've got to start thinking about the government as only one role being important, protecting our liberties and our rights. Life is dangerous. Driving in a car is dangerous. Downhill skiing is dangerous. We've got to stop thinking the government can save us from every little thing and start taking responsibility for our own lives and dealing with a little bit of danger. Hey, I drove through some water today, three feet of water flooding across my driveway to get here. Was that dangerous? Yeah. So what? I'm here anyway. But I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be part of this, this liberty effort. Thanks for having me on today, John. Hey, Mike. It's great to have you on uh, and talk to you. We're heading down here, countdown to the end of the show. We've talked about a lot of issues here, political, medical, maybe a little bit more medical than you're used to hearing. I thought it was important to get it out because it does impact on your freedom. That's the bottom line here. That's the power that can't be destroyed. Mike Adams, thanks so much. John Rappaport sitting in for Alex Jones. We'll see you again. Thanks, thanks Alex. So If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books, in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com.